they tried to achieve their ends by working entirely behind the scenes, corrupting and deceiving the public. The aims of such groups may be either good or bad, so far as the public interest is concerned, but their methods are a grave danger to democratic institutions. The films also showed how the responsible citizen could monitor the press themselves. They could create a chart that analysed the reporting for signs of hidden bias. But such earnest instruction was to be no match for the powerful imagination of Edward Bernays. He was about to help create a vision of the utopia that free market capitalism would build in America if it was unleashed. In 1939, New York hosted the World's Fair. Edward Bernays was a central advisor. He insisted that the theme be the link between democracy and American business. At the heart of the fair was a giant white dome that Bernays named Democracy City. And the central exhibit was a vast working model of America's future, constructed by the General Motors Corporation. To my father, the World's Fair was an opportunity to keep the status quo, that is, capitalism, in a democracy. Democracy and, ca and capitalism, that marriage, right, linking, like, just like that. He did that by manipulating people and getting them to think that you couldn't have real democracy in anything but a capitalist society, which was capable of doing anything, of creating these wonderful highways, of, of making, you know, moving pictures inside everybody's house, of, of telephones that didn't need cords, of sleek roadsters. I mean, it was, it, they were, it was, it was, con, it was consumerist, but at the same time, you inferred that in a funny way, democracy and capitalism went together. The World's Fair was an extraordinary success and captured America's imagination. The vision it portrayed was of a new form of democracy in which business responded to people's innermost desires in a way politicians could never do. But it was a form of democracy that depended on treating people not as active citizens, as Roosevelt did, but as passive consumers. Because this, Bernays believed, was the key to control in a mass democracy. It's not that the people are in charge, but that the people's desires are in charge. The people are not in charge. The people exercise no decision-making power within this environment. So democracy is reduced from something which assumes an active citizenry to the idea of the public as passive consumers, oh. driven primarily by instinctual or unconscious desires, and that if you can in fact trigger those needs and desires, you can get what you want from them. But this struggle between the two views of human beings as to whether they were rational or irrational was about to be dramatically affected by events in Europe. Events that would also change the fortunes of the Freud family. In March 1938, the Nazis annexed Austria. It was called the Anschluss. Hitler arrived in Vienna to an extraordinary outpouring of mass adulation. But even as he drove through the city, Behind the scenes, the Nazis were systematically whipping up and unleashing the hatred of the crowd against the enemies of the new Greater Germany. The Anschluss was a kind of explosion of terrible hatred against the enemies, so-called enemies or whatever they considered enemies, against the Jews in, in, in totally, and also uh, against a lot of very decent Austrians who had opposed the Nazis in Austria. They said it's legitimate, now you can do what you want. So they did it. Stealing, robbing and killing, I c can't say it otherwise. And human depravity, of course, is uh, 
always near, very near to, to, to normal behavior. It, be, it can change very quickly. As the violence and assassinations raged in Vienna, Freud decided he had to leave. His aim was to go to Britain, but he knew that Britain, like many countries, was refusing entry to most Jewish refugees. But help came from the leading psychoanalyst in Britain, Ernest Jones. He was in the same ice skating club as the Home Secretary, Sir Samuel Hoare, and Jones persuaded Hoare to issue Freud a British work permit. And in May 1938, Freud, his daughter Anna, and other members of his family set off for London. Freud arrived in London as Britain was preparing for war, and he settled with his daughter Anna in a house in Hampstead. But Freud's cancer was now far advanced, and in September 1939, just three weeks after the outbreak of war, he died. The Second World War would utterly transform the way governments saw democracy and the people they governed. Next week's programme will show how the American government, as a result of the war, became convinced there were savage, dangerous forces hidden inside all human beings. Forces that needed to be controlled. The terrible evidence from the death camps seemed to show what happened when these forces were unleashed and politicians and planners in post-war America would come to believe that hidden under the surface of their own population were the same dangerous forces. And they would turn to the Freud family to help control this enemy within. And ever adaptable, Edward Bernays would work not just for the American government, but the CIA. And Sigmund Freud's daughter, Anna, would also become powerful in the United States because she believed that people could be taught to control the irrational forces within them. Out of this would come vast government programs to manage the inner psychological life of the masses. Mm -hmm.